Hello citizens and welcome back. In today's video I want to talk about PvP in Star Citizen, how it compares to other games and how CAG are addressing excessive PvP. As always, if you like this video, sacrifice a like and a comment to the YouTube algorithm and subscribe for more. And here's a shout out to our amazing patrons for their support of the channel and the armory. The PvP debate has been around for as long as Star Citizen itself. At this point it's pretty much a weekly occurrence on Spectrum. Sometimes the threads are good and constructive, sometimes they are not. But the common denominator is that the comments get out of hand way too fast, as I am sure comments under this video are going to. Lots of insults and threats start getting thrown around, which then causes the thread to get locked before a constructive discussion is had. And I think that's very much needed on this topic, because player interactions are essential to Star Citizen. So I suppose that's why I'm making this video. Now, I don't claim to have all the answers, but I believe that there is a middle ground that suits all groups. Also, I would like to point out the caveat that the game is still very much in alpha and the majority of the systems that would regulate player interactions are not yet in place. So, the most recent debate was kicked off because some of the members of Griefernet were temporarily banned after allegedly disrupting a player-organized event. In this case, I believe it was the Daymar Rally. If you haven't heard about the Daymar Rally, here's a quick summary. The Daymar Rally is an annual racing event that takes place on Daymar. It is essentially an endurance race on the surface of the moon. It has been around for several years now and the team behind it are very talented and passionate about bringing this and other events into Star Citizen. Now, while the Daymar Rally is a player-organized event, it has become a major event in Star Citizen in general. And it has even grown to the point where it has attracted external companies as sponsors. And since last year, the Daymar Rally is even part of the Star Citizen lore. On the other side of the story is Griefernet, which is one of a few pseudo-organizations focused on causing maximum disruption of the game for other players in Star Citizen. Allegedly, they disrupted this year's Daymar Rally to such an extent that CAG has taken actions to temporarily ban some of their members, as far as we know. This means that their actions were deemed to be in breach of terms of service and the stream sniping and griefing policy. But CAG didn't elaborate on this in public as far as I know, so we don't have any details. Anyway, that's enough of the recent drama. I would say that griefing is a very small subset of PvP interactions in Star Citizen, even if accusations are thrown around on a regular basis. So before we move further into the video, I think we need to go over the rules CAG have defined. So far, publicly, CAG have taken a very vague stance on what is griefing and excessive PvP. In a nutshell, CAG say that they prefer the PvP solution, meaning that if you're a target of PvP, you should team up with your friends and fight back. We will get into more details in a moment, but generally this is a reasonable stance. They of course have provided some examples of what they consider to be griefing, and it pretty much follows the commonly accepted definition of using exploits to repeatedly disrupt gameplay of other players. They have also provided a way to report this behavior. This also came with a definition of stream sniping, meaning players using live streams or other platforms to find targets to attack. This specifically refers to infiltrating Discord servers and similar out-of-game actions. The problem with these is that it's extremely difficult to link the in-game consequences to a specific person which makes it very difficult to punish the perpetrators. I would also like to point out that in-game scouting and infiltration are valid tactics to be used in PvP interactions. But by being in-game actions, they can't be mitigated and defended against. When players face actions that originated out of the game, it's difficult to do anything about it. And that's why perpetrating such actions should be against the TOS. But now, why haven't CAG publicly stated the full list of offenses, their investigative process and the potential consequences? Simply put, it gives them the discretion to investigate and address each report individually. This essentially frees them from having to adhere to inflexible rules. And this way, after punishment is dealt, the person can't say that someone else did the same thing and were punished differently. Also, if CAG implemented some system to detect excessive PvP and similar behaviors, I don't think they would want to publicly acknowledge that it exists or what exactly it's looking for and how. This would be to prevent people from coming up with ways to circumvent the system. 
Now, I think it's a good time to talk about how CAG classify players based on the activities they prefer. CAG have talked about this in the recent episode of Inside Star Citizen about distribution centers. I thought it was very interesting. Essentially, they split players by lawful and unlawful based on their alignment with the law, and then also by passive and active based on their stance on combat. According to this, you could make an alignment chart just like this one. So an active, lawful player will be someone taking mercenary contracts to defend facilities or to capture bounties. A passive, lawful player will be mining, salvaging or trading. On the other side, a lawless, active player will be trying to rob facilities or pirate other players. It gets a bit complicated with lawless, passive players. The CAG depiction was not exactly a passive one, but I would imagine smugglers and hackers fall into this category. However, I think that they are missing something, and not all possible player profiles are captured. So for my own Star Citizen player alignment chart, I have added a third axis. And that is Profit. I have also renamed the Active and Passive axis to Combat Seeking and Combat Avoidant. While this does add a layer of complexity to the chart, I think it helps it capture player behavior better. I know it's quite complicated, but bear with me. So I believe that every player can find themselves somewhere on this chart. But let's talk about some examples. A lawful, combat-seeking, for-profit player will again be a mercenary looking for defense and bounty contracts. A lawful, combat-avoidant, for-profit player will again be a miner or a trader. A lawful, combat-seeking, non-profit player would likely be someone providing medical services in combat zones or someone delivering humanitarian supplies. On the other hand, Lawful, combat avoidant and non-profit player will essentially be a tourist or an explorer, just enjoying the beauty of the verse. On the unlawful side, an unlawful, combat seeking, for-profit player will be a mercenary or a pirate. An unlawful, combat avoidant, for-profit player is likely going to be a smuggler or someone who provides services. An unlawful, combat avoidant, non-profit player is probably going to be very rare. But again, I think it would be someone providing medical assistance, but in unlawful areas. Now, an unlawful, combat-seeking, non-profit player is what I call a murder hobo. Their only joy is to cause harm and chaos without any clear gain. And a small subset of these will be actual griefers. The difference between a murder hobo and a griefer is pretty clear. A murder hobo will kill anyone for the joy of killing. A griefer will use any means possible to disrupt gameplay, whether that is using exploits, pad ramming or other methods. Now, statistically, these are very extreme and very rare cases. Every player will likely find themselves in this chart, and the vast majority of players will likely find themselves closer to the middle. So where do you stand on this chart? Let me know in the comments! So now that we talked about the existing facts and rules, let's talk about the two sides of the ongoing PvP debate. Basically, the vocal part of the community is split in two camps. One side advocates for making PvP combat fully optional. This is the so-called PvP toggle or separate PvE servers. On the other side, you have mostly PvP players saying that Star Citizen was supposed to be a player versus all game, so a PvP toggle makes no sense. The pro-separation group brings some interesting arguments. The gist of it is that players currently have very few ways to defend themselves or rather prevent the attack before it happens. And that combat mostly tends to disrupt gameplay rather than create emergent gameplay. And while those are valid and interesting points, I think it's a bit early in the development to tell how CAG want to handle this. And while they do have some systems in place, I'm going to talk about those later. First, I want to take a look at some findings from other games. It's a universal fact that excessive PvP and griefing lead to poor player retention. This was found not only in Elite Dangerous, but also in EVE or DayZ and even in New World. New World especially had a problem with recovering even after special measures were introduced. So, Elite Dangerous does have a solo mode, which is the equivalent of PvE servers in Star Citizen. Essentially, it allows you to play in the live universe, but without meeting any players. I wasn't able to find any concrete data from Frontier on how many players use solo mode and how many players use open play. Most unofficial reports suggest an even split or slightly leaning towards solo mode. Elite did have a problem with excessive PvP in open play. 
Frontier eventually addressed this by introducing very harsh in-game penalties to players who exhibit murder hobo behavior. This is mostly in the form of in-game fines, bounties and reputation loss, which lead to the player losing access to resources and logistics, which eventually undermines their ability to continue. DayZ faced a similar problem, which was impacting player retention. The developers introduced limited safe areas and very harsh reputation punishments for excessive killing of other players, though the game's reputation never quite recovered. Another game that took a major player retention hit was Darkfall Online. It was a full loot, open PvP MMO, and it initially faced major issues with excessive PvP. And even though the developers implemented changes to the loot system and added safe zones and incentives for player cooperation, the game shut down due to low player count. And of course I have to mention EVE. EVE is famous for open PvP and generally a very harsh learning curve. It did face issues with low retention of new players due to relentless PvP and very harsh losses on death. Eventually, safe areas for new players were introduced as well as improved tutorials. The game has recovered and the core PvP element remains. Also, EVE offers other paths to success besides combat, so players have multiple options. Of course, there are games that don't have issues with PvP. One example I can think of is Elder Scrolls Online. The main reason ESO didn't have any issues with PvP is because PvP is limited to certain areas and players have to very willingly travel to those areas. Everywhere else, PvP is reserved for consensual duels. It also has level scaling to make PvP more balanced. There are other examples such as Guild Wars or Albion Online. However, the common elements between these are that PvP has a very well-defined set of rules and guidelines and in some cases even areas designated for it. Also, they reward both sides of the fight in some way, meaning that the loser doesn't get discouraged. And they offer alternative options besides PvP. Actually, even a fully PvP game like Foxhole offers non-combat gameplay. In Foxhole, logistics, construction and resource management are very important. And players who don't want to fight can find a lot of success in doing these supporting activities. So, how does Star Citizen do this? Star Citizen is technically a full loot MMO with open PvP, but it also has limited safe zones. And there technically is a system of punishments in the form of crime stat and jail sentences. There will eventually also be a reputation system that will make murder hobo behavior a lot more difficult by removing access to resources. Also, once multiple star systems are implemented, some of them will have a higher security status. This will technically create a way for players to opt out of PvP by simply relocating to an area where PvP is very difficult. But at face value, it's difficult to say if this will be enough to discourage excessive PvP. But I think that CIG is not done implementing features to prevent this. I am very curious to see how reputation is going to impact this. I think CAG are very well aware of the potential issues when creating an open PvP game. I am sure they have a lot of features to regulate PvP and keep it productive and in the designated areas. I also think there is a very good reason they don't publish any information on related features. First of all, this topic tends to generate a lot of drama in the community. Also, as I mentioned before, giving information on these systems generally leads to people finding ways to get around them. Also, I think that measures to control excessive PvP are very low priority for CAG at the moment. It's much more important to get other features like server meshing and additional star systems before reputation and regulation comes in. And with that being said, that's all for this video. What do you think? Should there be PvP-only servers? What features CAG can implement to discourage excessive PvP? Let me know in the comments. Thank you for watching, fly safe, and I will see you in the verse.